Hi, it's Matthew Reed from How to Repair Pendulum Clocks, and today we're going to be talking about thread matching. So if you work on clocks that were made very broadly before the middle of the 19th century, sooner or later you will have a tapped or threaded hole or something like a screw, a bolt, or in this case a bell standard to which you want to match uh, a fixing or a nut in this case. And um, the thread standards that we recognise today, like Metric and BA and Whitworth, didn't exist before this period. So although you find some localised thread standards, uh, the chances are you will have to use a couple of the techniques that I'm showing today to uh, make fixings to, to match. This is a, a bell standard uh, for a nest of six bells, and I think three or four of the existing nuts um, are okay, but either some have been lost or something's happened to them, and they've been replaced with modern uh, sort of uh, spacing pieces, but they uh, don't match the threads, so they're not um, functional. When we look at our thread um, nomenclature, uh, there are a couple of values that are particularly important to us. Uh, so here is a section... Uh, of a thread, right hand thread, and the primary um, value that's of interest to us in matching threads is pitch. That is the value between, say, one crest and the next crest, or one root and the next root of the uh, thread. And this is either expressed as a fraction of a millimeter typically, or as TPI, which is threads or turns per inch value. The second value we're interested in is our major diameter, so outside diameter of the thread that we are trying to match. So if you've got those two and you can match a thread to those uh, values, the chances are we're going to be okay. There are um, other values that we might want to take into consideration. That is minor or root diameter. We also have the uh, flank angle of the thread, uh, which um, is uh, changes with different uh, standards. And we can see that value is expressed here. And then we've got the shape or form of the thread as well, which uh, can be all sorts. And here we've got a rounded root and a rounded crest. But as I said, um, for our purposes today, for this um, fixing, which isn't really kind of load-bearing as such, uh, if we can match pitch and major diameter, then we are going to be laughing, as they say. So how do we measure pitch? Well, there are a couple of ways you can do it. One is with um, a pitch gauge. This is just a modern gauge with various different uh, pitches, a bit like a feeler gauge, really. And you can see here we're using one that has a pitch of 0.7 millimetres. So that's 0.7 of a millimetre, in this case, from one root to the next. And we can see that our uh, thread that we're trying to match is slightly finer than that. And when we look at the next one in the set, which is 0.6 of a millimetre, we can see that the thread is slightly coarser than that. So we know that our thread lies somewhere between 0.6 and 0.7 millimetre pitch. But that doesn't give us a massive amount of resolution. So my preferred way of doing this is to cover the thread that we want to match. And in this case, it's kind of easy because we've got such a kind of unusually long thread. Normally, you've only got, say, 10 turns or something. So I cover the thread with a bit of uh, black pencil and then just roll it or scrape it across uh, a piece of paper. And what this enables us to do is using the maximum number of threads is to measure um, the pitch. Now remember when you're measuring pitch that we're measuring from one uh, crest in this case to the next. So two crests equals one pitch for our first one. It's easy to start counting at one and you need to start counting at zero if that makes sense. Anyway, we've got uh, plenty to go out here, so in fact I can count 50 turns of this thread and using a steel rule, with a steel rule, you can get to within about 0.2 of a millimetre. We can calculate that our 
um, 50 threads equals about 32.2 millimeters. Therefore, if we divide 32.2 by 50, we get a pitch of about 0.64 millimeters, um, as we already know from our thread gauge. And 0.64 millimeters equals about 39 and a half TPI or turns or threads per inch. So a couple of ways of um, matching this uh, thread and the first one is with a uh, screw plate. Now screw plates um, are how historic horological threads were made. You can still buy modern ones actually for smaller work typically. So these are incredibly useful to pick up second hand on the internet or whatever. The problem is that they themselves are not a wider standardization so it's very difficult to know which of these plates is going to be suitable for the application that you want so the answer to that is really just to buy as many as you can and build them up over the years so i found a couple of screw plates that very broadly feel like they may match um that they may match my thread this one as you can see is signed mata so I'm going to um, look at that pitch, and I do that by finding uh, a hole in the screw plate, which is basically just a set of fixed diameter dies, and they taper from one end of the plate to the other, both in diameter and in pitch. And we wind in a piece of pegwood, but we can see that the pitch of this thread uh, in the screw plate, which feels okay, is actually fractionally too coarse, so not ideal. The next way that we might decide to match a thread is using a screw cutting lathe. If you have a screw cutting lathe, then um, you can make a tap, and from a tap you can make a die. In this case, the screw cutting lathe has got a gearbox fitted to it, and it happens that one of those pitches, 40, remember we're after about 39 and a half TPI, is pretty close and for these nuts which occupy about three or four threads at the maximum that would probably be okay but what I um, discovered was that the pitch that we are interested in 0.64 four millimeters or thereabouts is very close to the value of 4BA now many people watching this will be familiar with BA uh, thread standards that were developed towards the end of the 19th century based on a Swiss metric system and they were used extensively in the 20th century for clocks and instrument making. Now the problem with 4BA is that um, the uh, diameter is too small so the pitch is good but the diameter is too small but you can see here these dies, which unlike our kind of regular split dies where you can change the diameter a little bit by either putting a wedge-shaped screw into this slot or closing the die down with two screws in a die holder, these, these dies are actually uh, split into two completely separate halves. And what this means, within reason, is that we can use the pitch of the thread but we can increase the diameter relatively significantly, which is exactly uh, what we want. So let's give this a try. So my step in making uh, our tap is to take a bit of silver steel, which is a high carbon steel that you can buy ground to very specific diameters. And I turn it, or file it actually in this case, to the shape of a modern tap. The shape isn't actually particularly important as long as it's um, tapered and I just held up a tap and copied it then I use my 4BA die um, to uh, slowly reduce the diameter of this thread until one of the historic nuts that we've got fits well Once I've done that, then I'm going to cut some flutes in this uh, tap, so it does some cutting. Some historic taps actually don't have any flutes. They just make the thread by deforming the material. 
but I think that's um, likely to snap off in, uh, in this case. So I use a piercing saw, and I just push the piercing saw blade down with my uh, brass tweezers to make three little slits along the length of the tap. Once I've done that, then I want to actually cut some uh, relief, uh, making sure the tap is cutting in the correct direction, right hand thread. So I just cut the relief with a barrette file, so to file away some material on the non-working side of the little flute that we've made. Once I've done that, we have um, a homemade tap, but this material is soft, so we need to harden it. So after uh, very quickly filing a square for our tap wrench, I heat the silver steel to um, orange, to bright orange, hold it there for about 30 seconds and then I quench it immediately in cold water. I haven't shown that on the film but um, just out of the camera shot is a, um, a tub of cold water. So that is the key. Heat to bright orange, allow the temperature to soak for 30 seconds in the flame and when the piece is still at bright orange, quench it and stir it immediately in cold water. And what we end up with, with high carbon steel like this, is a tool that would be incredibly hard and resist wear, but it would also be quite um, brittle, in fact it would probably be very brittle and would snap when we were using it. So what we want to do is to temper that brittleness by uh, replacing the brittleness with a bit of strength. And we do that by more gentle heating. When you heat carbon steel, um, you'll have noticed that it changes colour and we can use those colours they're just an indication of the temperature that the steel is at to limit the amount of um, tempering we do and we want to temper to what they call very pale to medium straw that's kind of basically yellow so I left the tap on its stock so I can heat the stock and just allow the temperature to slowly creep along the tap and I've surrounded the, um, the tap with copper, little copper sort of um, bits of wire that I bought which will distribute the heat, act as a bit of a heat sink so again it um, slows down the speed at which we're tempering. So we temper very slowly until our tap has reached this kind of uh, straw colour and then just allow it to cool slowly. It doesn't need quenching again. So once we've done that, we can uh, remove the uh, host material and we can see whether it works. So I've got some old uh, cast brass plate here and we'll just drill a couple of uh, pilot holes and yeah, the tap works absolutely fine but my first set of pilot holes are actually a little bit big the, um, the thread isn't forming fully so what I did next was to drill some slightly smaller a range of, in fact, smaller holes until I found one that I felt um, was as small as I could get away with without the tap breaking.
and uh, yeah, it works. It uh, our new nuts fit the bell standard really quite smartly. I was very pleased with the result, so I just quickly tidied them up, and uh, that's it really. Um, hopefully, that was of use. As I said at the beginning of this uh, video, thread matching in the conservation of clocks is really incredibly useful. And you can see here, there are various ways of approaching it. One thing I forgot to say is if you've got access to a lathe with an infinitely variable lead screw, then you can cut any pitch you want. And so again, rather than using the uh, die to make the threads, you can actually cut the thread and follow the same process, make a tap, and from a tap you can make another die if you want um, to make a screw or something. So uh, it seems like a lot of work, but uh, in the preservation of clocks this is really uh, important and useful technique. So thanks for watching. If you haven't already, please like and subscribe and uh, leave a comment below. Thanks very much and bye for now.